hello I'm going to give this brief tutorial and I mean brief hopefully I'll just flip through these very quickly just to give everybody a better understanding of what RAB proteins do I'm not going to read through every single word here but you can read through them but RABs are proteins and these proteins are important for the delivery of cargo between destinations in cells. They are part of the vesicular transport system and these function on both the endocytic and the exocytic pathway. As proteins they're made up with a primary structure, secondary structure, and tertiary structure and I've drawn a crazy picture here with some alpha helices and beta sheets and this is not what a real RAB protein looks like but you could imagine that it's just a protein that has tertiary structure and we're going to talk about how that structure changes and that leads to its functions. RAB proteins are called GTPases and that is because they bind the nucleotide GTP and we'll see as we go through these slides they not only bind that GTP but they are also capable of hydrolyzing the GTP to GDP. There are a lot of GTPases in cells and GTPases are just a class of proteins. So all GTPases will bind GTP and be able to hydrolyze GTP into GDP. And we've talked about some of these in our class, RAB, RAC, RAS, RO, ARF, SAR, Dynamin. There are many other GTPases. Um, in fact, RAB stands for RAS associated protein found in brain. And so RAS was the founding member of this class of GTPases, also known as small GTPases. The role that RABs play in intracellular transport of vesicles is that they provide a molecular address by binding to other components such as tethering molecules and delivering cargo based on the binding of their tethering molecules to other tethering molecules on their destination compartments. Once again, I'm here trying to give you the idea that there are two structures, a GTP bound RAB and a GDP bound RAB. And I've just put the little nucleotide, it binds in the structure somewhere. This is not the real GTP RAB structure, but you can imagine, okay, it's bound to a nucleotide. Well, what does binding to the nucleotide do? One of the things that we know is that when RABs are GTP bound, as shown in this picture here, so there there is a GTP as I've drawn down on the right hand side. When it's bound to GTP, there is a lipid modification at the C terminus of the protein that is exposed. Conversely, when GTP gets hydrolyzed to GDP, as shown here on the bottom left of this image, what happens is that lipid modification gets tucked away and it is no longer available to be seen and the protein doesn't have that lipid modification showing. And that is important for the function of RAB and the function, one of the functions, the first things that happens with RABs is that they will bind to a membrane when GTP bound. We talk about RABs cycling or GTPases cycling from being GTP to GDP bound. And this is showing you the cycle. Up on the top we have GTP bound RAB and we consider that on. So this GTP bound RAB is on, it's got its lipid modification showing, the GTP is bound, and when it's on, it can do things. And what happens over time is that the activity of the RAB will hydrolyze this GDP, releasing an inorganic phosphate, and then the molecule is now in a GDP bound state. And that is considered the off state. Notice the lipid modification is tucked in on the bottom in the GDP bound state. And then what happens is over time, the GDP will come off and that allows for GTP to bind again. So all GTPases cycle from this GTP bound to GDP bound state and right back to the GTP bound state. And GTPases, depending on their functions, will do their different function 
depending on whether they're in the on state or the off state. Additional proteins called GAPs and GEFs can help to regulate the intrinsic GTPase activity of the particular molecule. In this case, we're talking about RABs. That means RABs are GTPases. They can hydrolyze GTP all on their own. But when this additional molecule, this GAP protein, GAP stands for GTPase activating protein, it binds to the RAB and it helps to accelerate the hydrolysis of GTP to GDP. And so what you see is the inorganic phosphate comes off even faster when the, G, when the gap is around. That leads to the GDP being bound and we're back in the off state. A second molecule called GEF or guanine nucleotide exchange factor can then similarly bind to the GDP bound RAB and that accelerates the release of GDP. And once GDP is released, that allows for the cytosolic GTP that's floating around to bind to the RAB again, and then we're back right where we were in the first place to the GTP being active with its lipid modification showing. So the cycle can be regulated by these additional proteins, GAPs and GEFs. Well, if we look at this in the context of what happens in vesicular transport, what I've drawn here is a donor compartment on the left-hand side and a vesicle budding off. And as the vesicle buds off, the RAB is associated with it through its lipid binding domain. And it may also, the, the RAB itself, may also be associated with other molecules that are called tethering molecules. And as the vesicle buds away from the donor compartment. It is the presence of the RAB and the tethering molecule that is going to direct it to its next location within the cell. This picture is just showing you now the RAB is still associated with the vesicle and there's cargo in the vesicle shown here as these green um, proteins that are transmembrane proteins along with some uh, blue and red soluble cargo and this red squiggly here is a snare protein and the snare protein is going to help play a role in fusion at the ultimate acceptor compartment but it is this RAB with its associated tethering molecules which directs transport towards the acceptor compartment and you might ask why the why is because there are additional tethering molecules that show up on the acceptor compartment, thereby linking the vesicle here through the RAB and its tether to the tether on the acceptor compartment. Once you have these two tethers touching one another, it brings the entire vesicle close enough to the acceptor compartment that the snares can now play a role in fusion. So this whole process leads to spatial specificity, meaning that the RABs help the vesicle get from one spatial location in the cell to another spatial location through the tether molecules. The snares are going to be the final component to play a role in this vesicular transport. And as you can see in these very minimal images here, the snares will interact and with the RAB still playing a, a role, the snares will start to bind. They will begin to fuse and as they begin to fuse, you can see we don't no longer need the interaction of the RAB tethers and those will actually um, end up being released. But the vesicle is going to be brought into close approximation with the acceptor compartment membrane. And as that happens, we have fusion of these two membranes. And now you can see this is just one membrane. Right? This is all going to end up fused into the membrane of the acceptor, acceptor compartment. We now have what's called the cis-snare complex, which is very tightly bound, and that needs to be broken up because this 
vesicle snare, the red vesicle snare will need to get recycled. And we also will end up with the RAB component on the acceptor membrane. Ultimately, the RAB will be recycled by the hydrolysis of GTP to GDP, and then that will cause the removal, not the, the hiding of the lipid tail, and that will then release the GTP, I'm sorry, the GDP bound RAB back into the cytosol for another round of uh, vesicular transport. I hope that helps you understanding RABs and GTPases, and I hope you have a great day.